Welcome to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. This is Pint Glass Football, drink beer, talk NFL and college football. I'm your host, Brad Fowler, and McKenzie Brewing is the official beer of Pint Glass Football. Follow them at McKenzie Brewing. Follow us at pintglassfootball.com. If you're new to the show, hit that subscribe button. What's up, PGF Nation? We've got another great show today. A legend passes away. A former NFL quarterback takes a shot at a current NFL coach. The NFL is making rule changes. It's time to pay one of the best defensive players in the NFL. Make or break quarterbacks. We'll discuss it. We're also going to continue with our NFL draft grades with the AFC West and a lot more to get to today. But joining me to do so, my co-host, Alex Higdon. Alex, what is going on? Hey, Brad. As you said before, big news, unfortunate news, but great life for a person that we're going to talk about soon. I can't wait to get to talk about the Bucky Brooks quarterbacks that we're going to talk about. Very big. I, I can't wait. I saw some things and I like some things that were said. So I can't wait to get to that. And of course, our continuous breakdown of the AFC West and my beloved Raiders. Yeah, big show, man. A lot to get to. Hard to believe it's May, which is, let's face it, the slow time of the year for football. But but it doesn't feel slow around here because we've got so much to get to. We're going to start with the legend, Jim Brown. As most of you, I'm sure, know, we lost a legend last week. One of the greatest NFL and college football players of all time has died at the age of 87. I don't usually always talk about every former player that passes away or every NFL player that retires, but there's certain guys, there's certain players that when they retire or when they pass on, we have to take a moment to talk about, and this is certainly one of those guys, we're talking about one of the greatest players to ever play the sport regardless of position. Now, Brown was selected to the NFL 100 all-time team. He was also ranked as the number one all-time player on the college football 150 list that college football just did a couple years ago. A lot of things we could talk about with Jim Brown, and we'll jump into some of them, but what are your first takeaways on Jim Brown? A guy that, you know, this guy played before our time, Alex, but just a unbelievable impact that he had on the game and what a career on and off the field. Absolutely. When you, again, as Brad said, before our time, but when you go back and you look and you can still see his impact today. And when I say impact today, we're talking about still to this day, he retired in 1965 and currently still to this day in 2023, he is still number 11. So just for further context, Frank Gore recently retired in 2020 and Adrian Peterson retired in 2021. If those guys would happen to still be playing, he would still be number eight overall. Basically led the league every year in rushing except for one and then led it uh, five times in terms of touchdowns. He's the only one that I could think of. I would have to double check. I didn't get a chance to that one rookie of the year and MVP in the same year, four time MVP in the four time MVP and just a simple career. And again, like I said, 11th all time, he's still ahead of some of your current favorite running backs right now. And they're probably not going to pass him. Derrick Henry is the closest at 8,335 yards in terms of active running backs. And Jim Brown is at 12,312. So this guy is standing the test. He's the ultimate in terms of standing the test of time because everybody else in that top 10 is has either played in the 90s the 90s or the 2000s, and he's the only one still standing there from the original NFL uh, championship team. Yeah, just incredible. I mean, the guy's career is, it's mythical. He's he's one of those guys, like you said, stands the test of time, a absolute legend in every sense of the word. He averaged 5.2 yards per carry, which is still the highest number in NFL history. A pro bowler every single year he played in the NFL, multiple-time MVP, like Alex mentioned, led the league in rushing eight times in nine seasons. He also led the Browns to three NFL championship games and an NFL title in 1964. They upset one of the great teams of that time, the Baltimore Colts, that was led by 
multiple Hall of Famers. They were a big underdog, and Jim Brown and the Browns destroyed them in that championship game. He retired at 30, Alex, and he was still at the top of his game. A guy who worked to empower the black community during the civil rights movement in this country. He also organized the Cleveland Summit, a meeting of the nation's top black athletes of that time, including guys like Bill Russell, Lou Alcindor, who we know later became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. This was all in in support of boxer Muhammad Ali and his decision to not serve in the Vietnam War. Look, Alex, Jim Brown's impact was big on and off the field, like I said. An absolutely legendary figure. He was before our time, like I mentioned, Alex, but he was ahead of his time. Absolutely. The size, the speed, the agility, the power, the balance. I mean, this guy was the real deal, the total package. He was a man amongst boys on the field. The best running back of all time, you could certainly make a case for it. And anyone who says Jim Brown is the best running back of all time, I'm not going to argue with it. No matter where you rank him, he's on a short list of the best football players of all time, and that can't be debated. So Alex Smith was recently on Sirius XM NFL radio. He made some comments about some head coaches with a defensive background and how young quarterbacks develop under them. He said, quote, there is a different mentality from my career when you play for an offensive head coach that wants to light up the scoreboard and outscore the opponent. There's a different mentality you have, especially as a young quarterback versus a defensive head coach when really the coach's mentality is, hey, don't screw up, don't turn the ball over, don't put us in a bad situation. A huge difference in a mentality and a mindset for a young quarterback, especially if it's a bit rocky to start. Now, Smith also called out Jets head coach Robert Sala by name and said, quote, Robert Sala, you're a great defensive mind and coordinator, But, like, you have no idea how to develop a quarterback. The coordinator you hired never called plays, so that's a completely different animal. And as much as you think you're prepared to handle that development of a young kid, you're just not, end quote. What did you make of these comments, Alex? Well, if we think about Alex Smith, the first overall pick in the draft, went to a defensive-minded coach in Mike Nolan. His, I believe his initial offensive coordinator was Mike McCarthy. So I can understand perhaps some of the, I don't necessarily say animosity, but some of the angst that he has in terms of what he's now being able to sit down and look at as opposed to, and then also having come from it twice over at that, because he went from Mike Nolan to Mike Singletary. And there was a lot of, even though the defenses were building and kind of good, the offense was lacking a lot. It was kind of just, maybe the defense and then a little Alex Smith running and a lot of Frank Gore. Ergo White, he's number three all time in rushing, by the way. But I think that that's him looking back on his career. And then also after going through that, getting Jim Harbaugh, then going to Andy Reid and seeing that, and then going back to in Washington, going to Ron Rivera and seeing the difference, the stark difference. And it's kind of unfair because of how we frame Andy Reid. But looking back at it, I can understand where he's coming from because he was there, then he went to one of the better offensive coordinators, and then he went to the best current offensive coordinator and offensive mind in Andy Reid, and then back to Ron Rivera. And I'm not sure the offensive mind was there in terms of the coordinator. But I understand what he's talking about from an overall head coaching mindset. Now, uh, I would say attacking Robert Sala, I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do. That he may have needed to take a couple of steps back because I think we've spoken about Zach Wilson before. Because there has to be two things: there has to be the willing quarterback, and then there has to be the coaching staff that puts the right plays in, that puts the right offense around, and can help him excel at what he does best. So I think there's more of a Zach Wilson problem there than a actual head coaching issue. There, so I would pull back on that. But overall, looking at it, I actually I actually agree. With this sentiment, you have to be able to pair, if you have a defensive-minded coach, you have to go on the high end of offensive coordinators. You have to get a guy in there 
that understands offense, that knows how to build an offense, a la when you had Sean in Buffalo and then you brought in Brian Dable that curated that offense around Josh Allen and then you got what you got. Completely understand his point here. Yeah, I do too. I don't think it was necessary to take a shot at Robert Sala either, though. I don't know if that was called for, but I understand when you're you're in the media and you're making calls and you're on the mic, bland takes usually don't move the needle. So, you know, sometimes he was trying to make a spicy take. I get that. He was trying to get people's attention and it worked. I mean, we're talking about it, right? But it makes me think more about, because I agree with what he's saying, but it makes me think more about the bear situation. And you draft a young quarterback in Justin Fields with a, with a first round pick and you hire Matt Eberflus, a defensive coordinator, a defensive minded guy. And at the time I questioned that move even then. And it makes me wonder if it's the best situation for him to be in and why they didn't go get a young offensive minded coach, a young up and coming offensive coordinator to be the head coach instead of going the defensive route. First situation that really stood out to me was the Bears situation after hearing Alex Smith's comments. Alex, we're going to get into some NFL rule changes that could be possibly happening here, but to enforce those rules, you got to have referees and the NFL could actually have a shortage of referees next season. 12 NFL refs have left this off season, which is the most since 2013. And it's just the second time in NFL history that double digit refs have left the NFL in back to back years to lose double digit refs in consecutive years, I think is certainly notable. It's currently unclear, or at least I tried digging up the research to find out why this is happening. I, I couldn't really find a definitive answer why so many refs are leaving the NFL right now. But I think when TV networks pay more for these refs to evaluate games from the booth than to make the calls in the actual games, I think that's part of the problem. But I think the NFL might have a real problem on its hands here, Alex. Unfortunately, we could be in for a rough season as fans from an officiating standpoint, and that's just not good for the game. Yeah, I, I, let's just talk about the three big sports, football, baseball, basketball. No sport has been more impacted by replay than the NFL. I'm sorry, there it just hasn't. There's a foul on every play in the NBA. We know there's holding on every play in the NFL and so on and so forth. So we kind of take the good and the bad with that. But when you go back to plays like what happened against the Rams and the Saints, the egregious pass interference call that was blatantly missed and we're watching it live on television and we can clearly see that. And then there's replay after replay after replay. It kind of may seem that the refs themselves, if I'm, if I'm put myself in their shoes, they don't feel protected at times. I think they feel very exposed. Um, they're probably getting a lot of crap from the players as well as the coaches, as well as the fans. These are the most scrutinized people. I mean, hey, who else got snowballs thrown at them as they were leaving? I believe that was either a Philly game or a Giants game, but I'm going to probably side with the Philly because we know how Philly gets. But these guys take a lot, a lot of crap. I mean, does anybody remember the Russell Wilson touchdown, no touchdown call? You know, how embarrassing is that? You have one ref calling touchdown? I don't know. And then can I understand if there are a lot of refs that are saying, I don't need this headache and I want to walk away. But we need them because that really affects the integrity of our game. You're 100% right. I don't think any official is under the microscope more than NFL officials. And quite frankly, it's because the sport is so popular. And because of that, you're going to have so many more eyeballs on it. You're going to have so much more scrutiny. I, I think it's a great point, and it's an interesting point. And I hope the NFL figures out a way to retain the talent that they have in their officiating because it's like I said, it's not good for the game when you have high turnover at such an important piece of the game. Now, speaking of officiating, there's going to be some new rules here, Alex, and I want to get your thoughts on these because a new rule that would alter kickoffs has passed by an 8-0 vote from the competition committee in March, but now is facing opposition among special teams coaches and players. According to Albert Breer of Sports Illustrated, there's doubt surrounding the chances of this rule actually changes. Now, the new rule would make any fair catch fielded before the 25-yard line to be ruled a touchback, placing the ball at the 25. It's the same rule that's in place currently for college football. The rule is being done in an effort to reduce injuries on kickoffs. Now, the pushback here, Alex, from the players and coaches, they state 
that 11 of the 19 concussions that occurred on kickoffs last season came when runners took the ball out of the end zone and that this would not be helped by the new rule. Albert Breer also reported that Sean Payton, Bill Belichick, John Harbaugh, and Dan Campbell are some of the coaches opposed to this new rule change. We know what this is about. This is all about player safety. There can be some pushback, and I understand special teams is the one that's taking the biggest hit of all from a lot of the rule changes, specifically when it comes to pick uh, kickoffs and when it comes to punting and punt coverage and kickoff coverage. However, we know that this was something that was identified as ongoing car collisions, so I can understand the NFL protecting the entity as a whole, and they're unfortunately – focusing on special teams. And I think there's a theme here. I'm not sure if they're just going to, I believe it was Bill Belichick that said, hey, why don't we just start everybody at the 25-yard line and eliminate kickoffs altogether. But they could actually be leaning in this direction by what they're doing with special teams overall, which would ultimately affect rosters and roster size. So I think it's something to keep an eye out on in the next five years because they're going to continuously tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak to see where we are in five years from now as these rule changes continue to evolve. Yeah, so the verdict on this rule is set to take place on Thursday. So when this episode drops, we should know the outcome. But for the rule to pass, 24 of the 32 franchises would have to approve it. Now, Alex, I'm with you and I'm all for player safety. I I really am. But if the numbers just don't support the claim, then I'm with Bill Belichick and these other coaches opposing it. Why eliminate even more opportunities for players to make an impact on special teams? Kickoff returns, for me personally, I think they're one of the most exciting plays in football. And to completely get rid of them or to eliminate them from the game, I think would just be really tragic. Now, the other rule change that could be in place here, Alex, that I want to touch on here is the NFL has approved a bylaw to allow teams to dress a third emergency quarterback on game days. Now, if two active quarterbacks are injured or disqualified from the game and unable to participate in the game, the third quarterback could then come up. Alex, this is clearly a reaction to what happened last year in the NFC Championship game where the Niners simply ran out of quarterbacks due to injury Nobody wants to see Christian McCaffrey playing quarterback. I mean, let's face it. That was a train wreck. It really derailed what should have been an exciting and fun NFC Championship game. Unfortunately, because of injuries, it just left them in such a bad place. Hats off to the NFL, though, once again, always looking to improve the product on the field. It's another reason the NFL is by far and away the most popular sport in the U.S. They discover a problem, and they're quick to fix it. Absolutely. We knew this was going to be reactionary. We actually even saw, and I'm not even sure who the backup quarterback was for Miami, as I know they were starting their third string. And even if you want to go further, Baltimore, and they were already shot at starting their second string as well. So I think this is a good look. This is very, this is very good for the NFL. It also helps development because now you can have a guy on there that you're continuously developing that's going to be able to possibly see action but travel with the team be there on game day if they don't travel with three quarterbacks, if they happen to only travel with two, you know, get them on the, on the, on, on the air, bud to hear the plays being called to kind of get some mental reps going on during live game. So I like it. It works out. Per- it works out perfectly. I mean, who knows who that third quarterback might've been for San Francisco I mean, with Kyle Shanahan, knowing how to pull a rabbit out of a hat, anything is possible in this game. So I'm not mad at this change at all. Yeah. And I think it also is going to, affect the NFL draft going forward. I think we're going to continue to see more and more players getting drafted in these later rounds. And I think it's also going to give more guys from the XFL and USFL a chance to make these roster spots. I think it's a good move. And like I said, I applaud the move. I think it's a really smart move. And I like what you said as far as the development and having guys on your roster and working behind the scenes to maybe get a chance if needed. So I love it. The Las Vegas Raiders owner, Mark Davis, has acknowledged earlier this week that he has come to an agreement with Tom Brady to join the organization's ownership group. Reports state that Brady's 10-year, $375 million contract with Fox to call NFL games, which is due to start in 2024, wouldn't be affected by this investment with the Raiders. 
Alex, we're seeing former professional athletes investing in team ownership. That's nothing new. It's something that we've seen these last 10 or 15 years. We're seeing more and more of this. But when the greatest player of all time decides to invest in an NFL team, it's a pretty big story. Absolutely. And this being my favorite team and openly, I ask for it all the time. I think it's time that we get new ownership in here. There's been a lot of the way that our franchise has been run. Once uh, Mr. Davis passed on, it's kind of been in flux a little bit. And now that we are now back in flux again, and I have no idea what we're looking at this upcoming season. Maybe it's the first cog and possibly opening up the Raiders for sale. I mean, I think Mark Davis has done a wonderful job in terms of getting the team out of Oakland. And I've been to that stadium, terrible stadium. Sorry, not sorry. Getting them into Vegas, getting that stadium built, the Death Star, and putting them in a, in a prime location that's now prime for action and everybody to visit. If, if you have not visited the uh, Las Vegas stadium, please buy a ticket. It's worth it. And then, and also go on the tour. You'll love it. But I think this puts them in position to possibly, with Tom in the building, perhaps not knowing the full details of everything because we don't know what percentage. Usually these percentages are maybe about anywhere between 1% to 3.5% for the most part when you buy into a team. So I'm interested to see how this develops in the next five years for the Raiders. I'm, I'm a big proponent. And I'm happy that Mr. Davis has gotten us to Vegas. But I think we might need fresh ears and fresh eyes in terms of someone leading this organization. We've had a lot of dissension uh, from the executive ranks over the past few years. And there's been a couple of rumblings. I'll leave everybody to Google that. But I like it because I think possibly this team could be sold in the next five years. And for a good penny, too. He improved the value of it uh, twofold with the move. Yeah, this is a franchise that, as we know, they've had limited success on the field the past 20 years or so, but it's still in a historic NFL franchise. They have a rich history, one of the biggest fan bases in the league, and like you said, their value has at least doubled since moving to Vegas. I'm really interested to see how much impact Brady has on this team. Is he in the ear of Mark Davis? How much influence will he have on this team making decisions? Or will he have any? It's really going to be interesting to see the next time we watch a Raiders game, if Brady's going to be up in the box sitting next to Mr. Davis, you know, are they having conversations? It's going to be kind of a fun thing to see just how much impact he has on this team from an organizational standpoint, if any. But it's definitely a noteworthy move. So, Alex, this story has been making the rounds. Apparently, at rookie orientation, Anthony Richardson, after the dinner, apparently stayed behind to help clean up. Now, Richardson stayed and helped until the room was back to where it needed to be. He said, quote, we left this room in an unacceptable condition, and it's not right for us to expect the staff to clean it all up. I also read a story where Richardson and fellow rookie wide receiver Josh Downs spent a lot of time in the hotel parking lot developing chemistry by running routes, working on their timing the night before rookie minicamp started. Alex, we both have real concerns about Anthony Richardson's lack of experience and ability on the field and if his game will translate at the next level. But one thing is for sure, after reading this story, after hearing some of these reports, This young guy gets it. These stories say a lot about his character, his work ethic. Now, quarterback in the NFL, it has a lot more to do with what's above your shoulders than physical ability. We know he has the physical traits. It sounds like he has it, Alex. The maturity and the the mental makeup possibly to develop those skills into a really special player in this league. Alex, I know I'm pulling for him. Yeah, you know what? I, I have to say, when I initially, when we initially started and I gave my quarterback rankings of rookie quarterbacks and I put him fifth behind uh, Hendon Hooker, Levis, and Levis, I, I did not talk, only talked about him on the field. And that is one of the things that do not, that does not show up on the stat sheet is leadership. And I probably had I thought about it, I probably would have put him above Will Levis because I believe he's a better leader than Will Levis for things like this. This was Troy Vincent, the head of football operations for the NFL, who called Chris Ballard, the GM of the Colts, to let him know personally, hey, this kid gets it. Let me tell you what he's doing right now while everybody has left 
to go on about their business. He stayed behind to make sure that not only did the tables were clean, but everything was done and he left when the crew left. So this being, this tells me this is a guy that's going to put in the video time, excuse me, the film time. This is a guy that's going to be the first in, perhaps be the first in, be the last out. And he's going to work with those players. And that is what you want when you have a rookie head coach, when you have this young team, and when you're going in to say, hey, I want to be the guy and I'm going to prove why you picked me where you picked me. You did not make a mistake. So kudos to Anthony Richardson. I mean, he has a great life story as well. Taking care of his little brother, taking care of his family, you know, being on his own, getting himself into school and doing, you know, I, I did not want him to leave. I thought he would have done wonders staying in. But hey, if you're going to go in the top 10 of the NFL draft, then yes, it's time for you to go. So kudos to this young man who appears to get it and get it early. No doubt about it, Alex. And I feel the exact same way. I was really grading this guy based on the on the field things that I saw. And, and we talked about it. We broke down his game. We're not going to go over that again. If you want to listen to our breakdown, go back to some prior episodes. But the mental makeup and the maturity and some of the things that we've talked about here tells me that he 100% has a chance to develop into a special player because he's clearly a special young man. So I really love those stories. Alex, Jets defensive tackle, Quinnen Williams has made it clear that he wants to become the highest paid defensive tackle in the NFL. New York drafted him third overall in the 2019 draft. He has developed into an elite defensive player. He's coming off of a career year. He was a first team all pro, a pro bowler, and he received defensive player of the year votes. He had 12 sacks. 12 tackles for a loss in 28 quarterback hits. He's become one of the very best defensive players in this league, a run stuffer, a guy who collapses the pocket and puts pressures on quarterbacks. On a recent episode, Alex, we talked about Dexter Lawrence recently signing an $87.5 million contract with $60 million guaranteed. I would expect Williams' new deal to be in that same ballpark. Yeah, this guy was a monster. Improved, improved. Uh, from six sacks to 12 sacks. We know what that Jets defense looks like. He is the leader of it, especially up front, applying the pressure. Uh, again, I agree with you. I expect him to be anywhere between 25 and 30 mil, maybe try, probably just a mil or two back of where Aaron Donald is, but a little bit more than I believe Jeffrey Simmons, who just signed his deal. This guy has really put in the work and he is earning this paycheck. So kudos again, I, we can never hit on anybody for getting paid, but this is the first step in the Jets keeping this team together. They have a very young defensive core. They have a buddy. I also have a very young offensive core led by a veteran. This is one of the things that you're looking for when you are a Jet, excuse me, when you are a Jet fan and when you are a part of the organization to say, hey, they take care of their players. Once you take care of Quentin Williams, you're going to have a lot of people that's going to say, okay, this team knows what they're doing and they take care of their own. And I think you're going to see something special from the Jets this year. I can't wait. Again, I said it last week. I'm going to continue to say it. Brad, we were in the space before you heard me say it before. When we get into these conference, excuse me, when we get into these division breakdowns, I can't wait to surprise everybody with where we're going with these picks. That's a teaser, guys. That's a hell of a teaser because we got a ton of great content coming up. No doubt about it, man. It is actually hard to get all the content that we want to get in on these episodes because there's so much that we want to get out there for you guys. So quick side note here before we continue, if you guys haven't already subscribed to the newsletter, go to the website, pintglassfootball.com, check out the newsletter. Not only will you stay up to date on all the new episodes that drop, but I've also started putting out some content and some articles right now. I just posted an article recently, top five college football breakout players for next season. There's so much stuff here, Alex, that we want to get to every week. I felt like some of the extra content that maybe doesn't make it into the episode, I'm going to start putting in the newsletter. So be sure to check that out, guys, at pintglassfootball.com. But to jump back to what we were talking about here, you're absolutely right about the Jets. You're absolutely right about this team because they pushed all their chips into the middle of the table when they traded for Aaron Rodgers. And it's become Super Bowl or bust in New York. There's no way around it. Now they got to pay their best defensive player. They've got to get this deal done. I expect it sooner than later. Hey, PGF Nation, are you tired of the same old bland food at your tailgate parties? Well, let me tell you about my friends at the Tailgate Foodie. 
the seasoning and barbecue sauce company that specializes in elevating your tailgate and backyard cooking game. With their unique blend of spices and sauces, the Tailgate Foodie will take your taste buds on a flavor journey that you won't forget. Use code PINTGLASSFOODIE for 15% off your first order at thetailgatefoodie.com. Zencaster is the ultimate web-based podcasting solution. It provides high-quality audio and video podcast production and hosting. With a full suite of professional tools, podcasters can seamlessly record, produce, and publish studio-quality content all from one dashboard. Zencaster's post-production process takes the headache out of audio production. Set the right podcast loudness and levels while reducing background noise with a click of a button. Coordinating all your guests to record in person is painful and tedious. Easily invite up to 11 participants per recording with one click. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use my code PGFP, and you'll get 30% off your first three months of Zencaster Professional. I want you to have the same easy experiences I do for all my podcasting and content needs. It's time to share your story. Hey there, PGF Nation. You know what's important when you're having a good time? Staying hydrated. And that's where Liquid IV comes in, the category winning hydration brand that's fueling your well being. With just one stick of Liquid IV, you get two times faster hydration than water alone, plus five essential vitamins to keep you feeling your best. And let's not forget about the convenience factor. The packaging is perfect for on the go, whether you're tailgating or just hanging out on the couch. But what really sets Liquid IV apart is the amazing flavors. Personally, I'm all about the Concord Grape and Lemon Lime. And with three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks, Liquid IV is made with premium ingredients to give you the hydration and nourishment you need. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code PGFP at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code PGFP at liquidiv.com. So next time you're cracking open a cold one and settling in for the big game, make sure you've got Liquid IV by your side. Trust me, your body will thank you. Alex, recently, Bucky Brooks of the NFL Network and NFL.com wrote an article titled Confidence Rankings on Nine Quarterbacks in a Make or Break Year. Now, the nine quarterbacks are ranked one through nine, one being the most confident that they'll succeed, down to nine being the least confident on his list. I thought this was a great list. I thought it was interesting, and I thought it would be a lot of fun to react to this list. Now, the quarterbacks are at one, and I'll go down from one to nine. Starting at number one, Jared Goff, Jimmy Garoppolo, Kirk Cousins, Mac Jones, Jordan Love, Ryan Tannehill, Baker Mayfield, Desmond Ritter, and at nine, Sam Howell. Let's talk about these quarterbacks, Alex. What are your thoughts on this list? Where do you agree with Bucky Brooks, and where do you have some pushback? I actually don't have any pushback except for number two. Number two is very interesting to me, and I'm not saying that just because I'm a fan of this team or a supporter of this team, but I, I'm very, I'm always weary of coaches who don't know how to pivot off of what it is that they know which I saw a lot last year with Derek Carr. And I noticed, you know, in the, in the uh, article he mentions in reference to Jimmy Garoppolo, Hunter Renfro, and so on and so forth. I don't really even believe Hunter Renfro is going to be with this team opening day because they're open. They're openly, well, they're not saying it, but they are openly shopping him. So everything that was here that we saw prior to him coming here, that was a playoff team. It's now being stripped down and changed into something different. So I, I'm very wary on if, that works. So my confidence is not high in Jimmy Garoppolo. I probably would have dropped him down. I probably would have dropped him down to a six or maybe even a seven, but I definitely would have dropped him behind Mac Jones and Jordan Love because I have more confidence in Mac Jones 
going with Bill O'Brien, also getting Mike Gusecki, getting these other receivers there. I have more confidence than him. I have more confidence in Joy Love because I believe that coach will now be able to run the ball instead of passing all the time. I think they'll become a run first team with defense, which will also help out Jordan Love. Ryan Tannehill, I probably would have dropped him, to be honest. I probably would have dropped him to number nine. I have zero confidence in him. I don't even think Tennessee, I don't even think they want him to do well. I think they're ready to move on, even though I believe he's going into the last year of his contract. The Kirk Cousins one, and I'll close here. The Kirk Cousins one is interesting because of what we've been talking about. And if you've been following, we I don't want to say we called it out first, but we did call it out. There's a lot of changes coming to this Minnesota team. If Dalvin Cook is not on this team, I think the confidence in Kirk Cousins has to drop. I think when with Dalvin Cook not being there, if what we've been seeing and reading the tea leaves, if he's not there, that's going to affect that play action, which has been working to perfection over the past few years as well. So I'm interested to see if that happens, I would have to draw, I would have to probably reorganize this list and drop Kirk Cousins down some more. Yeah, that's interesting because he has had that strong running game. So Kirk Cousins is definitely an interesting one. I, I think I honestly, though, I think I'd probably have Kirk Cousins at the top of this list and nothing against Jared Goff. Jared Goff deserves to be up towards the top. But Kirk Cousins is probably the most consistent, reliable quarterback on this list. And from a confidence standpoint, I pretty much know what I'm going to get out of Kirk Cousins. It's not going to be great, but it's not going to be bad. He's going to be a solid starter year in and year out like he always is. He's going to put up decent numbers because he, well, let's face it, he always makes the safe throw and it tends to make his stats look better than they are. Jared Goff, great situation, great offensive line. I think he'll he's in for another solid year. Clearly, they believe in him because they had a chance to draft a young quarterback this year. They decided to double down on Goff and continue to build around him in this offense. I'm glad you brought up Jimmy Garoppolo, though, because I'm with you. Look, I like Jimmy Garoppolo. I think he's been a really solid player in this league for a long time. But how does Bucky Brooks have this much confidence in a guy going from Kyle Shanahan's system where every quarterback looks like a star to a head coach that I think is incompetent? I know they have a history with New England. I know he's familiar with the offense. But to think that Jimmy Garoppolo is going to come in there and just have some above average season or a great season, like you said, possibly with Hunter Renfro on the move, nothing Josh McDaniels has done going back to his first stint as a head coach and now him as a head coach with the Raiders, nothing that he has done has given me any confidence that he knows how to operate as a head coach in this league. Is he a good offense coordinator? Yeah, I think he's shown that. But nothing tells me that he's going to have success with Jimmy Garoppolo. It's a downgrade from Derek Carr. Now suddenly Jimmy's going to come in there and save the day. I don't see it. I think Jimmy deserves to be way down further on this list. Mac Jones is interesting. I see him at four. I think it's fair because I expect a bounce back year for Mac Jones. You touched on it here. Bill O'Brien coming in. The offensive play calling and the offensive coordinator situation last year in New England was a mess. You bring in a real OC, a guy that really knows how to call an offense, a guy that really knows how to design plays, a guy with experience at the position, and I think we're going to see a big upgrade from him. He's a limited player. He clearly has a ceiling, but I think Bill O'Brien will be able to get a lot more out of Mac Jones. I expect a nice year from him. Jordan Love's a huge question mark. I, I don't really know if anybody really knows what they have in Jordan Love. I don't know if the Packers know what they have in Jordan Love. We talked about that on some recent episodes with the contract extension that they created with him. I think they created that extension because they don't really know what they have and they needed an out just in case he's not the guy. But I like what you said about the running game and supporting him with the running game and setting up the play action and some of the things that will floor Shanahan and McVay. That style of offense really thrives when you can run the ball. I think the Packers will get back to that more than we've seen in the Aaron Rodgers era. Ryan Tannehill, I'm with you. I would have no problem bumping him all the way down to the bottom of this list. Sam Howell is another guy that's a huge question mark, and I get that at nine. But clearly Washington must have seen something with Howell because they're another team that opted not to take a quarterback and to, and to see what they have in Sam Howell. So they must clearly have some level of confidence in him. Baker Mayfield, I mean, I, I think it's this is it for him. I mean, I'm, I'm actually shocked 
that he's even getting another chance to start in this league. Nothing about him says starting quarterback. He had an, an unbelievable situation in Cleveland behind arguably the best offensive line. He had weapons. He had running backs. He had everything in place to have a high level of success, and he was mediocre at best. I just don't imagine him going to a worse situation once again in finding success. So he's another guy that I have no problem bumping down to towards the bottom of this list. It's definitely interesting, though, Alex, and I thought it was a lot of fun to take a look at. One more piece of news before we jump into these draft grades. Ian Rappaport has recently reported that after three months of not being able to throw, apparently Brock Purdy can begin throwing again next week. This is a great piece of news if you're a 49ers fan. Absolutely. Coming in right now, we don't know who's going to be the quarterback. They have Trey Lance. I know that they have Kyle Shanahan, but hey, when you got what you got out of Brock Purdy last year, you want to get him back on the field because it only takes one year for defenses to catch up. And we know he was not working with the entire playbook at his disposal, but you want to get him back in the camp, give him a full camp and get him up to speed because defenses catch up and they catch up quick. I love, you know how I love watching film and I saw some things that I'm like, okay, I'm not Rex Ryan or anything, but Hey, I recognize this right here and I recognize it a lot and they better tweak it and tweak it fast. Yeah. I I think it's great news for the 49ers because we know there was a lot of question marks about his return after the injury. Would he be ready week one? Would he even be ready by mid season? There was a lot of speculation early on in the process, not knowing where he would be at, but the fact that he's already going to be able to throw again here pretty soon is really great news for them because let's face it. I think they found a diamond in the rough here in the seventh round. I know I was really impressed with what I saw from Brock Purdy last year. And clearly they're ready to move on and let him take the keys to this franchise. I'll be shocked if Trey Lance does not get traded before week one. I think they're ready to move him. I think they've been ready to move him. It's just a matter of finding the right trade partner, but definitely great news for the 49ers going forward. All right, Alex, let's jump in to some more NFL draft grades. We're going division by division every week. Let's jump to the West Coast, AFC West. I'm going to start with the L.A. Chargers, Alex. In the first round, they took Quentin Johnston, the wide receiver from TCU with the 21st overall pick. Now, wide receiver was a need for this team. Mike Williams just can't stay healthy, and Keenan Allen is past his peak. I like that they addressed the wide receiver position early in this draft. Quentin Johnson is a good player. I like him. He's going to be another big target for Justin Herbert. He's going to be a red zone threat because he's really tough to defend on those 50-50 balls with his size and jumping ability. He has the physical traits and the upside to be a big-time wide receiver in this league. The only knocks on him, I would say, is he had a very limited route tree at TCU. I think they're going to need to expand that. And probably the biggest red flag is his hands are somewhat of a concern. Drops too many easy ones. Too many concentration drops I see on tape with Quentin Johnson. Like I said, love the traits, the size, the speed, and athleticism. But here's the other issue I have with this pick, Alex. Zay Flowers went one pick later to Baltimore. So I like the player. I like Quentin Johnson but not over Zay Flowers. And because of that, I'm not a huge fan of what they did there. Now, in the second round, they shifted to the defensive side of the ball and took Tuli Tupulato, outside linebacker for USC. This guy was a productive player. And I love seeing guys with big-time production because I, I think it's usually a pretty good indicator that a guy is going to be able to produce at the next level. I hate when guys just have traits but don't back it up with any real production on the field. Not this guy. 13 and a half sacks, 22 tackles for a loss last season at USC. So you want to talk about a guy that was really disruptive. He has the blend of size, strength, and athletic ability that is really hard to find because this is a guy that I think could play in a 4-3 or a 3-4 front awesome motor. I mean, this guy doesn't quit from the first snap to the end of the game. He's going to give you 100% effort 100% of the time. He has that ability to bend on the edge. 
He's got good mobility, agility. I, I really like this guy. I think this was their best pick by far. Now, he could afford to bulk up a little bit. I don't think that's a huge concern, though, because I think an NFL weight room can fix that. But as far as the player, a second-round guy that I think was a great pick. Now, in the third round, they took Dayon Henley, an inside linebacker from Washington State, a guy that is really fast to flow to the football with the ability to cover tight ends and running backs in in the passing game. I mean, this guy's really quick on his feet. He's an explosive finisher, a guy that can blitz the quarterback. He's got good speed, toughness. Now, he's still developing as a linebacker. I don't think we've seen his best football yet, but this is a guy that I think was a late second-round grade, and to get him at the 85th pick in the third, I think was nice value. I was a little surprised he was still available there because he's really an explosive athlete with a lot to like. Now, in the fourth round, they took wide receiver Darius Davis, also out of TCU. Most likely, I think this is a guy who's going to be more of a special teams contributor, but I think he could become a valuable kick returner, possibly a punt returner for them. He has really great speed, especially in the open field. I like a lot of the players that the Chargers took here, Alex. Johnston over Zay Flowers is really my big issue here. Now, it's not what I would have done, but the Chargers also passed on running backs in this draft, which I thought was really surprising. I thought that they would at least take a flyer on a guy somewhere in the mid to late rounds. They decided not to. That was interesting. I thought that was a position where they could have added some depth. But other than that, I think this is a pretty solid draft by the Chargers. I'm going to give them a B minus. I might have bumped it up to a B plus had they taken Zay Flowers, maybe even an A minus. I just don't like taking a guy that I don't think is nearly as good as Zay Flowers, a, a guy that you know as well as I do. We're both really high on. So I'm going to ding them for that. But the rest of this draft and the positions they addressed made a lot of sense to me. The Los Angeles Chargers. And I want everybody to know I'm being very objective when <laughs> I judge the AFC West. I gave them a C plus, and I'm going to tell you why. I didn't like the Quentin Johnson pick for the exact reason that you said, not when Zay Flowers was still there. This is another guy, as you said, with a limited uh, route tree. He does not have a quick twitch. He is a typical 50-50 ball guy. And I look at him and I see Allen Robinson. And that that's not saying Allen Robinson's a bad player, but what you developed when Mike Williams and Keenan Allen got hurt on that wide receiver tree, you also had developed Drew. I believe his name is Drew Carter. You had Joshua Palmer. And you had Joshua Palmer. I believe Drew Carter might be a free agent though. You also had Jalen. You also had Jalen Guyton as well. So you had a lot of guys that you were able to develop along the lines and have them step in at the X or the Y while you were able to move Zay Flowers all around that field and give. Justin Herbert a big a, a nicer target that can get open and you can also spread out your offense even more. The other thing that I thought they should have done is maybe have traded back and grab Nolan Smith. And the reason I say that specifically, you know how I love to look at contracts. I don't believe they're going to keep Joey Bolson next year, especially when you're going to be talking about you're going to have to pay Justin Herbert. So I think he's a cap casualty and you would have been able to slide Nolan Smith right into that position with Khalil Mack on the other side to give him some tutelage and give him a couple of easy look one-on-one looks as well. The Thule pick I did, I'm just going to call him Thule. I do not want to butcher his name. I thought it was a solid pick, but not, I don't like his size and, and, or his bend, but I think it, with their three, four defense, he won't be asked to rush the passer for the most part. He'll just be in that three, four, hold him up, let the linebackers come and do their job. I agree with you on Dayon. It's very funny because I have the same notes as you on Dayon Henley. I 1,000% agree on that. I also wondered, with them picking him up, what are they telling me about Kenneth Murray, who's going to be coming into his fourth year? And I know he's kind of been oft injured, and he's a good player, but I don't know if they're getting what they want from him or if they're just going to stick or if they're just going to put them both at the inside linebacker and have probably the fastest inside linebacker duo in the league. So I'm interested to see what they do there. The Darius Davis... Did not like that pick, but I'm with you. Perhaps what they saw is a special teamer. But the one thing I did see is they love TCU players because they also drafted Max Duggan. So maybe there's a TCU connection there. But overall, for me, 
I gave them, I, overall for me, I gave them a C plus. I thought they could have done a lot better with, especially the first two, excuse me, the first pick, the Kansas City Chiefs. Again, I am prefacing this as an AFC West fan. I am being very objective. Shout out to you quick. With their first pick, I actually like this pick a lot. Felix and Aduke Azuma. I think he's a really good pass rusher, but lacks the run defense. But I, what I do like about this, if you recall what, The Indianapolis Colts did when they drafted Robert Mathis and they had Dwight Freeney. They look like they're going to be a team that's playing from ahead a lot. And to unleash these two guys, to unleash Felix, and then you also have George Karloftis on the other side after letting go of Dunlap and Frank Clark, and you still have Chris Jones in the middle. These two guys on the edge pinning their ears back when Kansas City is up on the team can see where they were going with that. Rasheed Rice, I believe I talked about him. We talked about him last week. And specifically, when I looked at that Southern Methodist schedule and I saw they had Maryland and Deontay Banks was a number, was a first round pick and Rashi Rice tore him up for 11 catches, 252 yards. And we know that Andy Reid has a knack for finding these receivers. He's 6'1", 204. A lot of people criticize the pick, but I like the pick because I just don't believe Kadarius Toney is going to be healthy and losing Juju Smith-Schuster and looking at MVS as just really a 50-50 ball guy who's going to primarily be stretching the field, and you also have Skylar Moore. You needed another guy that can be a possession receiver. Fantasy alert, keep your eye on Rasheed Rice after week seven. Keep your eye on him. Y.A. Morris, they needed another offensive tackle. They did bring in they did bring in Jalen Ward from Jacksonville. And they also signed Donovan Smith as well. But Donovan Smith has been off been injured. And I think here with Wanye Morris, shout out to Boyz II Men, that's the name of the lead singer as well. You have a guy here that is a swing tackle that can play both sides. And they have a very, very, very strong line. Creed Humphrey, Joe Tooney. They did a great job in drafting Creed Humphrey last year. We know they lost big Orlando Brown, but then replacing him with Donovan Smith and also bringing in the gentleman from the Jaguars. That looks good. And I like Wanye Morris with an opportunity to learn behind those two guys. Now, here's where I feel there's a little bit of a drop off when you get to the fourth through seventh rounds. But hey, again, I'm never going to go against Andy Reid and the brain trust. But Chamari Connor, this this looks like for me is a special team of BJ Thompson and those. But and all in all, I'm giving the Kansas City Chiefs a B because I love Felix. I think he's going to be able to pin his ears back with George Karloftis and go after quarterbacks. Again, I spoke about Rasheed Rice on another pod, but I think this guy is a sleeper wide receiver that nobody's talking about. So I'm going to give them a B plus. Yeah. I like what the chiefs did too, Alex. They really added players at positions of need, especially early in the draft, a wide receiver, right tackle. I think they filled in some nice depth pieces, especially on the defensive side of the ball later in the draft. I like rice a lot too. I think he's just a do it all wide receiver. He's not the burner that they've had with past picks, but just a really solid do-it-all wide receiver. I thought this was a really solid draft from the Kansas City Chiefs as well. I don't know if it was the flashiest draft, but I think it was another really solid draft from this organization and did a nice job finding players that fit what they do and fill some needs and add some depth to this roster. So I I think it's a fair grade. I'm I'm with you. I think it's a BB-plus draft. Now, I'm going to jump to the Denver Broncos. Their top two picks went to the Seattle Seahawks as part of that Russell Wilson trade. And another first rounder they acquired for edge rusher Bradley Chubb ended up going to New Orleans in part of that Sean Payton acquisition. So we got to jump to the second round here with their first pick. They took Marvin Mims Jr., the wide receiver out of Oklahoma. This guy's got some big-time speed. 4.38 40-yard dash. He primarily lined up inside of Oklahoma, but I expect him to play mostly in the slot as far as in the NFL, but I think he could be a little bit underrated as far as being able to play on the outside, especially as a deep threat. This guy has big-time speed, so... I think they're going to move him around a decent amount in this offense. An explosive chunk play wide receiver averaged almost 20 yards per catch at Oklahoma. He's a smooth route runner. He can really get in and out of his breaks. He offers some extra value as well as a punt returner. He made plays at all three levels for the Oklahoma Sooners. A really solid wide receiver and a guy that I think was a nice pick in the second round. 
Now, in the third round with the 67th pick, they took linebacker Drew Sanders out of Arkansas, my top-ranked inside linebacker in this class, and my pick for Defensive Rookie of the Year. I talked about him on an earlier podcast. If you guys want to go back when Alex and I picked Offensive and Defensive Rookie of the Years, this is a guy who can just really fill up the stat sheet. I mean, a do-it-all player, physical traits, athleticism. He can play inside linebacker or be a stand-up edge rusher. He's got really good technique, good discipline. He's a long, explosive, sideline-to-sideline range. He consistently beats blockers to the spot. That is something I love about his tape. I had a late first, early second round grade on this guy. And to see him fall to the 67th pick in the third round, I just think was great, great value. I actually saw a few mock drafts with him going in the first round. So I know I wasn't alone with that grade. There was a lot of people that thought he might be a guy that could sneak into the first round. To get him in the third round, I think, is just outstanding. This guy is a big-time player, a big-time athlete. Now, they had an additional third-round pick. At the 83rd spot, they took Riley Moss, the cornerback out of Iowa. This is a guy who made my list of sleepers. One of my favorite sleepers in this draft. Once again, go back and listen to some of the older episode, guys, if you haven't already. He played in 54 games with 38 starts for the Hawkeyes. I love the experience, and it shows because he's tough. He has ball skills and a high football IQ. He's an instinctive defender with really good size and strength. Now, a lot of analysts think that he's going to have to switch to safety in the NFL, and he might. It, that might be the route this, in, this guy ends up going. But I think he has legit corner talent, and I would not be completely shocked if he gets some run at the corner spot at the NFL because he's an explosive player and he has an explosive ability to cover ground and break up passes, no matter where he ends up in the secondary, I think he's going to be a really good player. They had a sixth and seventh round pick that I want to quickly touch on here. JL Skinner, safety out of Boise State. Really solid player, a guy that I was surprised with that late. And their seventh round pick, Alex Forsyth, a center from Oregon. Both players, I thought, that really could have been drafted earlier than the sixth or seventh rounds. I think they were good value picks. I'm going to give them a B plus, Alex. Yeah, I, I agree, Brett. I think with that, with their first pick in the second round, the Marvin Mims pick, I actually like that a lot because they are – at the crossroads between Tim Patrick, Cortland Sutton, and Jerry Judy on what they're going to do going forward. I believe this is uh, Jerry Judy's fourth year. So they're, we're going to find out if they're going to pick up that fifth year or not. So now you have somebody that you can slide in there. If you want to keep one or the other, you have one that can step right, that you hopefully that you can train up and slip, step right in at the end of the year. We already talked about Drew Sanders a lot. We know that this is your sleeper pick, excuse me, for Defensive Rookie of the Year. I won't believe the point. I like it. I like him a lot. They did need to upgrade the middle linebacker situation, and this guy slips right in and falls right into play. Riley Moss, I had some questions, but the more I watched a little bit of the tape, I got it. I get it. He's in position. He doesn't have the athleticism that I think, and when we look at the other side of that tandem and Patrick Satane and what's going on. So he's going he's gonna to possibly get targeted a lot when he's on the field, whether he's in the slot or whether he's on the outside. So depending on how much he plays, he could be a marked man. I mean, their biggest offseason pickup has been Sean Payton, without a doubt. But I think Marvin Mims, Drew Sanders, and possibly Riley Moss can step in and do some things. But those first two picks, getting Marvin Mims and getting Drew Sanders, great value at the second, excuse me, in the second and third round. Guys who that can probably be a part-time starter in Marvin Mims if Jerry Judy, who often gets hurt, We'll be able to step right in. And through Drew Sanders, who I think is going to be a day one starter out of the gate. My beloved Las Vegas Raiders. Now, with their first pick, number seven overall, they took Tyree Wilson. I did not like this pick because I wanted Christian Gonzalez. I thought he was right there, right for the taking. You have not had a guy like this since Nambi Asamoah and when you had Charles Woodson back there as well. We've been looking for someone in the, the, the defensive backfield to come there and be a number one starter, and we're still looking 10 years later. We still cannot find our guy. However, 
after I got over the hyperbole of everything I just said, and I sat down and I watched Tyree Wilson, I like him. I actually like him a lot. I still would have rather Christian Gonzalez, but I've tempered how I feel about the pick now. I love what I saw. I love the production over the last two years. That's what I look for is consistency. I don't want to see a guy pop in one year. I like to see a consistency over at least two to three years, and I saw that from Tyree. His size alone, 6'6", 271 pounds. He can be a linebacker sometimes, or they may be able to do a little zone blitz and drop him into coverage. With his size, you can also slide him inside and play him at, and play him at defensive tackle as well at times if you want to do some do a couple of multiple things. And we know Josh McDaniels, coming from that Belichick tree, likes to have multiple players. Their second-round pick, Michael Mayer. This was the guy. This was my favorite pick of the Raiders draft. If you ever saw what a Bill Belichick player looks like, or rather a Bill Parcells player looks like, it's Michael Mayer. Inline blocker, not the fastest guy in the world, great hands, will be where he's supposed to be when the ball is thrown. Precise route runner, great blocker. He's not Dalton Kincaid where you can split him out wide, but he's more, let's just say, Jason Witten in terms of being his blocking and being able to eat up and gobble up six yards, seven yards, short yardage passes and help move those chains and put you, keep you in short yardage or inside the 20. Now we get to the third round. Byron Young. I did not like this player at all. I felt he was overdrafted. And if you've been listening to the podcast, I've been saying, and I started last week when I started with Keely Ringo, there are going to be some people from a lot of these teams that aren't the guy. And looking at what I'm looking at with Byron Young, I'm not sure he may he's the guy. He may have been one of the players that benefited from a player like Will Anderson being on the field as well. Prototypical boomer bust. And further, the reason I don't like it, because at that time, you had Jalen Hyatt, Cedric Tillman, Y.A. Morris, and Dayon Henley, who we just spoke about with the Chargers. The Raiders have not had an inside linebacker since I don't know when. Lyle Alzado, I don't know. You guys help me. But you can't pass on those type of players when we lack depth at wide receiver, when we don't have an inside linebacker, and you did not go after one offensive lineman in the entire draft, and that is a, the weakest part of our team outside of the, our defensive backfield. You cannot do that. So this, to me, was a complete reach, and I did not like, and I did not like the pick at all. Speaking of wide receiver, they went and drafted Trey Tucker out of Cincinnati, a 5'9", 182-pound receiver who perhaps, maybe, as you heard me speak earlier, Hunter Renfro's replacement, because I don't believe that Hunter Renfro will be on this team, or is he just going to be, if he's just going to be a special team, or I don't, I'm, I'm not sure they butchered the third round. I thought these were two ways to draft picks with too much talent on the board at the time. Jacorian Bennett from Maryland, this was the cornerback on the other side of Deontay Banks. He looks like he can be a player. It's going to take some coaching up. He's a player. I didn't, I liked the pick in the fourth round. I thought that was a nice value pick and somebody that we can work with. Aiden O'Connell, I'm mentioning him because he is my Brock Purdy. I mentioned him maybe in our first or second pod, Brad, that this was a guy that I saw the Brock Purdy of this draft. Accurate. He's not as big and as strong as a quarterback that you would like, but I loved what I saw from him. Toughness, standing in the pocket, sliding his feet, eyes down the field. Now, if Josh McDaniels wants to prove that he's not another Belichick cast off coach that is a failure develop this guy show us something because we know this team is not long for jimmy garoppolo overall for the raiders i'm giving them a c minus i did not like anything primarily when you got to the third round i gave them some credit for jacorian jacorian bennett and i like the aiden o'connell in the fourth round as well that is a potential starter to me maybe in two years we'll get to see something from him but i just did not like what they did with the entire draft specifically and I reiterate specifically, not drafting any offensive lineman. And that is a very bad job by the Raiders not picking up any offensive lineman in this draft. Yeah, I have a hard time getting excited about this draft too, Alex. I, their first round pick, Tyree Wilson, when we broke down the player or the prospects in this draft, we, we focused on a lot of first round guys. We knew he was going to be a top 10 pick. He's a guy that looks really good getting off the bus. I mean, chiseled, six foot six, 270 pounds, but he's a really raw prospect. He has a lot of development to do. 
in two or three years, we'll we'll know if this guy really belonged in the top 10. I think he has a lot of upside, but not sure he's ready to make an impact year one. So I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Tyree Wilson. I like taking guys in the top 10 that are more of a sure bet, but I definitely understand the upside. Michael Mayer, the tight end from Notre Dame, a lot of people had him as the best tight end in this class. He's probably the most complete tight end in this class. I liked your comparison to Jason Witten, a true inline Y tight end who can catch the ball, who can block. Just a really solid pick. I think by far their best pick. I'm with you on Brian Young, the defensive lineman. Look, I've read that he's a great locker room guy and a high character guy, a big time leader. But I thought it was a reach in the third round as well. Not a lot to get excited about, but that is going to do it for today's episode. Before we go, I want to give a shout out to today's sponsor, our friends at the Tailgate Foodie. Check them out at the tailgatefoodie.com. I'm Brad Fowler. He's Alex Higdon. This is Pint Glass Football, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening to the Pint Glass Football Podcast. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at PGF Podcast.